Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I'm the Director of the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS, and welcome uh, to everybody here this morning. Uh, we are very, very pleased to have Antoine Hoff, our good friend uh, from the IEA, here once again to do the midterm uh, oil market review. You know, we were just saying before the session, we've, we've had a lot of IEA folks uh, in town recently, both for the, the midterm gas market review, uh, but then also uh, uh, the energy technology perspectives. Um, but that's actually not all the stuff you've put out recently. So you have a big investment study that was put out, a big strategic stock study that was put out. So uh, things are busy in Paris, huh? Uh, so anyway, but this uh, midterm oil market review couldn't come at a better time. Uh, we, we're certainly in a period where uh, where oral markets are doing a lot of interesting things, uh, things that we probably wouldn't have predicted sort of three or four months ago, and you can look three or four months ahead, and uh, things may not look the way that we're predicting them to uh, right now. So uh, we are very, very pleased to have you here today to talk us through some of that. Uh, Antoine will give a brief presentation, uh, and then uh, we'll have uh, an open discussion. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> thank you for coming uh, on the summer morning. And uh, yes, we, we're having many publications these days, <clears throat> probably too many. We actually have many meetings these days to, at the IEA to see how we can reduce our number of publications. <laughs> uh, but uh, so very grateful. It's, it's great to be able to be here to share some of our findings and also to get your feedback. And uh, this report, unlike the WIO, for instance, uh, is not, has not so far been peer reviewed. Uh, it's kind of a, an extension of the oil market report, which we keep very much confidential until the, the release. Uh, but the confi confidentiality need for this report may not be as obvious as for the oil market report. It's not as commercially sensitive. So I think in future, we will probably try to get it a little bit more peer-reviewed before publication. Okay. Uh, but now we're having peer-reviewed after publication, I guess. <laughs> so I, I just want to share some of the findings, some of the key messages, I guess, that uh, came out of our work. This is a, an exercise we do every year, but since we've done it for the last six or seven years. Uh, and, and as Sarah said, now we also do the same for gas, uh, renewable, coal, and, um, and even efficiency. Uh, so here are some of the key, key uh, takeaways, if you'd like. Basically, if we compare our forecast for the next five years to the end of this decade with the forecast we put out just last year, the story has changed in some ways, and it's, it's similar in some other ways. So we, we continue to see an increase in, in supply a little bit faster than the increase in, in demand. So we continue to forecast a, a kind of easing of balances and a little bit of an increase in, at least on paper, the amount of spare capacity that we think would be available from OPEC. Uh, even though uh, this has to be qualified and there's you know, many caveats that go with that. Uh, but the increase in capacity and the easing of, of the market is not quite as pronounced as we thought last year. And this reflects a couple of uh, changes. Just the fact that this, the forecast goes out one more year to 2019 instead of 2018 changes things because we see many things happening at the very end of the forecast period, at the very tail end, both on the supply side and on the demand side. So we, we feel that we're kind of getting close to an inflection point uh, later this decade, and 2019 will be very different from, from 2014, for instance. Uh, and this is both on the supply side and on the demand side. And also, the other things that changed the, the, the tonality of the forecast since last year it's just everything that's happened since then, over the last year, uh, which kind of changes uh, our expectations of, of the next few years. Um, so in terms of uh, supply, the story continues to be driven by the North American supply revolution, U.S. light title, first and foremost, also Canadian uh, sands. Canadian light title uh, comes into the picture towards the end of the forecast in particular. Um, and also we see some growth in, in Brazil, delayed growth, the growth that we had been expecting for many years. We see that coming this year and the next few years as well. Uh, but what changes, I think, a little bit from last year is that we see the, um, the growth in North American supply easing a bit towards the, the end of the, the, the forecast period as the uh, 
the uh, U.S. supply comes closer to what I think our colleagues in the WIO team see as a plateau in the, somewhere in the 2020s. Uh, but at the very end of the forecast period, we see other countries uh, catching up on the line title uh, story and starting to develop their own resources uh, in, in a meaningful way. Not huge in 2019, but not insignificant and just the beginning of a trend that we think we, we pick up momentum in the 2020s. So the, the light title story and the fracking story becomes kind of a global story instead of just a, a, US, a US story. Um, the, the offset to that growth in, in uh, basically what we still call unconventional supply is the slowdown in conventional supply growth and particularly the risks in OPEC production. So our forecast of OPEC production is somewhere around two million barrels or slightly more of additional capacity over the next five years. This is not inconsistent with um, the trend, the historical trend, but what's very unique in the next five years is that this is a, a very lopsided growth because most of it is from one country, uh, which is now at, at significant risk, which is Iraq. So Iraq in our forecast, and this is a forecast we did before the ISIS, um, the beginning of the ISIS offensive. So it doesn't reflect the latest developments uh, in, in the North and uh, the, uh, the move towards a possible uh, falling apart or splitting apart of the country, but it reflects problems that we had seen before that. Uh, so we have downgraded the Iraqi forecast, but we still see Iraq in this forecast as accounting for most of the, non -OPEC, of the OPEC supply growth. So that's, that's uh, obviously something that's very much at risk now. Uh, in terms of demand, we use the IMF forecast as an input, so we, we continue to see uh, uh, acceleration in global economic growth in the next few years as the recovery picks up momentum. So we see a pickup in the pace of demand growth, moderate pickup, uh, 2014, 2015, maybe 2016. But beyond that, we start seeing the impact of other factors offsetting the uh, role or, or the effect of economic growth and population growth. So we see a bit of an inflection point, not in demand, we continue to see demand growth, and we see demand reaching 100 million barrels per day by the very end of the forecast period. Uh, but we see the, the growth, the pace of growth slowing down uh, as uh, efficiency gains become more uh, significant, as there's more uh, emphasis on uh, environmental regulations, cutting uh, oil consumption some, to some degree, and more fuel switching away from oil uh, towards other fuels, and in particular natural gas, as well as uh, at the margin coal and, and renewables uh, also. Uh, and, and then we pay a lot of attention in the forecast, not just on supply and demand, but across the supply chain, at the midstream sector, at the downstream sector, uh, at trade flows, and at the product supply. And this year we've done a, a fairly extensive product supply forecast. So there the story is the continuation of, the, of, of the, what we had sketched last year, which is a kind of a redrawing of the, of the crude trade map uh, with the shift completely eastward. Uh, North America, in our view, becomes a net oil exporter by the end of the decade, and Asia is really the magnet for pretty much all the, the global uh, crude trade. Um, but we see a little bit of a decline in, in the volume of crude being traded internationally, and a little bit of an increase in product trade, a shift from, from crude to product, with uh, very significant increases in refining capacity, mostly uh, in uh, East of Suez country, uh, countries in Asia and in the Middle East, upgrading of capacity in, in Russia, continued creep in, uh, in, in, the, in North America and the US. So we see more, uh, we see the emergence of very large merchant refiners, basically refining hubs, uh, sending out products to the global market, and we see Europe uh, coming under very significant pressure. We do see some problems in terms of product supply because of the imbalance uh, between the, the crude slate, the, the production, the, the, the quality of the crude being produced, and, and the, the, the nature of the demand barrel. So we see most of the growth coming from the middle distillate uh, segment, and this, in our view, becomes a problem because at some point, there's a risk that the global refining system we put out too much gasoline and too much naphtha and that there won't be a market for that and finding an outlet for that very light supply we become a constraint uh, 
on supplying the market with the, the products that the market really needs. So that's, that's kind of, a, in a nutshell, the key, the key points. So looking at uh, the map of uh, global demand growth, uh, broken down by, by region, um, Asia continues to be the region where, in our view, most of the oil demand growth will come from. Uh, but we do see a continued slowdown in the pace of Asian demand growth. So it's number one source of growth, but it's a, it's a, it's a region where demand growth starts slowing down, and that's particularly driven by China. We see China as uh, you know, entering a new phase of development, a new phase of economic growth, a bit slower, and a, a type of, of economic activity that's less energy intensive, a lot of emphasis on energy savings in China. The government is very uh, determined to rein in consumption growth, to rein in emissions uh, growth and, and pollution. Uh, there's a lot of fuel switching away from oil in, in the transport sector in China, which has an effect, at, at least at the margin. So we see a slowdown there. That's part of the story why we see demand growth globally slowing down a bit towards the end of the decade, the forecast period. The Middle East, on the other hand, uh, continues to grow. Uh, so we, we've adjusted uh, a little bit since then our expectations for the short term, at least for Iraq, for obvious reasons. But as a, as a region, we see continued growth in Middle East demand. Uh, that's a very significant source of growth. Africa, we see as booming. So it's booming from a very low base, obviously. But uh, the, the African economies uh, have been among the best performing economies since the financial crisis. There's scope for continued growth. In, uh, this is not fully captured in statistics, by the way. Uh, it is captured in statistics to some degree, but we think that the real growth is even larger than what's captured in, in statistics because of the lack of statistical capacity and because so much of the economy is also under the radar, not fully uh, above ground. But in terms of uh, the anecdotal uh, information that we gather about uh, product imports in, in Africa, for instance, it's, it's phenomenal. So we see very strong growth there. Um, and we see uh, moderate growth in, uh, in the FSU, uh, but we see declines in, in Europe, not quite as steep as in the last five years, but uh, continued small declines and uh, some growth in, in the Americas. Now, broken down by, uh, by products or by sector, uh, demand uh, remains mostly driven by transportation, by the transportation segment that accounts for more than 50% of uh, the demand barrel. Um, Demand for stationary uses like uh, heating or electricity generation, industrial users, in our view, we continue to decline everywhere with one exception, which is the Middle East, where we see uh, growth in, in power generation uh, demand for oil, uh, just because the, the, um, the, the region uh, is not expected to succeed in, in uh, ramping up enough gas production to, to really generate uh, enough electricity without producing more oil-fired uh, electricity as well. Uh, and what we do see is a significant increase in demand for uh, non-energy uses, specifically for petrochemicals. So very strong growth in, in petrochemical demand for oil. The petrochemical sector becomes more integrated with the, the rest of the, the oil sector. In other words, petrochemical plants uh, are getting increasingly integrated with the refining uh, sector. And refining margins really uh, are, are getting very difficult to assess now without looking at the petrochemical margin as well. Uh, so we're, we're not fully actually up to speed on, on, on trying to you know, upgrade our assessment of margins. We continue to look at refining margins, looking at refined products, not really taking the petrochemical downstream into account, but really that, that, that really ought to be done to really capture the economics of, of refineries because they, they're really now increasingly joint integrated uh, refining and petrochemical plants. Uh, but, but we see significant growth in, in petrochemical demand, and that's driven by demand, by consumer demand in places like Asia, where there's you know, very fast-growing demand for uh, petrochemical-based products, plastics, and so on. But also in, in North America, it's driven by the, by the supply side, the availability of very cheap feedstock, uh, which make North America very competitive in, the, in, this, uh, in this sector. Uh, we do see more than before uh, competition against oil in the transport sector. So this is something we had kind of uh, picked up last year in the forecast last year for the first time. Uh, but we, we see the pace of uh, penetration, particularly of gas in the transport sector, as slightly uh, faster than what we had even expected last year. Uh, 
So this is uh, something we, we expect in the US uh, for economic reasons, because gas is cheap and, and looking for market, but also for policy or environmental reasons, uh, particularly in places like China, uh, where there's a very strong need to uh, cut back on emissions, clean up the, the air around big cities. So there's a very strong push there for converting bus fleets, truck fleets to gas, uh, LNG, CNG, and so on. Um, in terms of our supply, really, uh, there's a very strong contrast. It's, it's still a, a non-OPEC driven uh, supply story. We see supply uh, capacity growing to 105 a million barrels per day, but this is very nominal because we don't, this includes OPEC capacity, some of which we don't think will be really available to the market. Last year we had not, um, we had kind of done away with the idea of trying to assess effective OPEC capacity as opposed to nominal OPEC capacity in our medium term forecast because we introduced this a few years ago, this idea of effective capacity, the capacity that's really there to the market. Uh, because of the increase in disruptions that we had experienced in the last few years, but, uh, and we, we used a sort of rolling average of recent disruptions as an adjustment factor, but we thought last year Libya had come back from the civil war, was producing at near, near full capacity. We thought uh, it doesn't make sense to apply you know, major disruptions like the Libyan civil war uh, to the next five years. Well, now this year we think it does make sense to, to, to apply it. So we reintroduced it, uh, but it's kind, of a, it's kind of a symbolic, it's kind of a token in a way, uh, adjustment, because it's very difficult to, to, to determine on what basis to make that adjustment. So we have an adjustment which is about 1.5 million barrels per day. So we think that real capacity would be at least 1.5 below the nominal capacity. Uh, but most of the growth will we, we come from non-OPEC region, and most of the growth will we, we continue to come from, uh, from the Americas. That's going to be the big driver. Uh, in, uh, in, um, in OPEC, we've uh, taken down our forecast of capacity somewhat. We've taken down the forecast from Iraq, but as you see on, on this graph, um, so we, we've taken down significantly, especially at the tail end, of, at the front end of the period, then it, it catches up towards the end. But the, um, the um, distribution of growth among OPEC countries is very, very contrasted. So very steep growth in uh, in Iraq uh, compared to the other ones, and we do see uh, flat growth in places like uh, Iran uh, or Libya. Um, in Iran, this is an improvement on the, what we had expected last year, which was contraction. We're not forecasting here an, uh, a lifting of sanctions. We've assumed that sanctions remain in place, so that could be adjusted in, in case of an easing of sanctions. But what we, the reason for the more positive outlook for Iran is the election of Rouhani and the fact that the uh, the management of the oil resource in Iran is, is being taken back from the revolutionary guards, which had become very uh, uh, dominant under Ahmadinejad and had not been very effective at running the oil sector, to say the least. So we see a, a move towards a more professional way of managing the oil resource. Uh, this is why we, we are moving from contraction to kind of flat, flat production. Uh, but this, again, this does not account any easing of sanction, for any easing of sanctions. In Nigeria and, uh, and Kuwait, we see contraction. So uh, Kuwait was not happy about the forecast. And this is maybe a little bit counterintuitive because Kuwait has not been in the news very much uh, in terms of uh, political turmoil or insecurity compared to some of its neighbors. Uh, but what we see in Kuwait is, uh, is political gridlock, is a lack of opening. Uh, Project Kuwait is still, uh, has been, talk been talked about for 30 years, is still not making headway. We just haven't seen any projects in Kuwait. We, we, can't, we can't identify any projects. So uh, I, I, I realize this is a sensitive issue in Kuwait, and uh, maybe we're understating the, the potential. But this is our best estimate based on all the information that we had available. And we've spoken to, to all companies, which uh, privately have been also very pessimistic about Kuwait. Uh, some of the consultancies are more optimistic. Uh, most of the consultancies do have Kuwait as a client. Uh, but the, the companies privately are, 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 that we spoke to were more pessimistic. Uh, so looking at Iraq, again, this was a forecast done in, uh, before the, uh, the events of June. We tried to account a little bit for the events on June in the wording of our report. We had to redraft some sections just before the release day. Uh, but the, the numbers we couldn't change, and we wouldn't know exactly on what basis to change it. So they, they, haven't, they haven't changed. Uh, but the forecast is, uh, is very much a reflection of the situation today. Uh, 
most of the growth that we expect in Iraq capacity uh, we see coming from the South. So the South has been you know, seen as more insulated from the violence of the last few weeks uh, than the North, obviously. Uh, nobody, I think, expects uh, Sunni insurgents to really move into the, the Shia South. Uh, and we, for that reason, maybe there's some confidence that uh, some of this growth will happen uh, in, in Iraq. But of course, that doesn't mean that the South is, is, uh, is completely uh, uh, safe from, from attacks. Uh, there's, there's significant risk. Uh, even without moving into the South, the, the ISIS or other groups could uh, disrupt the South in other ways. So, uh, and, and then the, we haven't really uh, applied here any kind of upgraded expectation of supply from the North. Uh, many analysts are now feeling confident that there's probably more growth coming from the KRG or the, the Northern part of the world. We haven't done any, we haven't applied any of this in, the, in this forecast. Um, in, uh, in terms of non-OPEC supply, again, it's, uh, it's still largely dominated by North America. So the, the kind of caramel uh, color uh, area in this graph represents uh, OECD America. So that's mostly US and Canada. Um, but the, the, the share of this uh, North American component of supply growth kind of diminishes towards the end of the period. And we see more growth coming from, uh, from Latin America uh, and some growth coming from other places as well. So again, we see a little bit of a, of a pickup in the, in the pace of, uh, in, in terms of light type of supply outside of North America, just at the time when growth in North America, in our view, we start slowing down a bit. So we see, we see growth in, uh, in Canada growing to 400 from a smaller amount today. And we see some growth in Russia and Argentina, which around uh, 100,000 uh, barrels per day each. But just the beginning of a very steep ramp up, we think, in the, in the next decade and a tiny bit of growth in Australia and Mexico, but a very large potential in those two countries. So, you know, there's been many discussions, a lot of discussions about why, you know, light title has come in the, in the US and not elsewhere, and whether it can be replicated elsewhere. And many people have pointed out that uh, the US is very unique because it has both the resource, it has the, the uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, culture, it has the right uh, investment framework, the right legislation, the right uh, subsoil ownership rights uh, design, uh, infrastructure is there, the, the, the skilled labor, all those factors, we agree, uh, mean that it, the light title supply could not have happened uh, anywhere else than in the U.S. But in our view, that doesn't mean that other countries, once the technology improve, continues to improve, cannot adopt this technology and apply it to their own resource. So it, it could not have happened in Russia, it could not have happened in Argentina, but it can be taken to Russia and it can be taken to Argentina. And what we see is that many countries are kind of backtracking from the trend in resource nationalism that had been dominant in the last decade or last 15 years. Places like Argentina and Russia had been increasing taxes, royalties, kicking companies out uh, uh, more or less forcibly. Uh, now we see a, a, a turnaround as those countries try to create the conditions to make an investment in, in non-conventional, in light at all possible. So the, the, the Russians have adjusted the tax regimes uh, in the Bajanov play to, to attract investment, and this is succeeding. Many companies are, are now investing in, in the Bajanov. Uh, Argentina settled its dispute with Repsol uh, in a hurry this year to attract investment, and this is, I think, will make the, the country more hospitable, more attractive for investment, and will help uh, speed up development of the resource. Uh, we, we do see a lot of NGL production. This is largely uh, driven by the U.S. with all the shale gas associated with NGLs and maybe NGLs dri driving the shale gas production to a, to a large degree. Uh, but we also see NGLs coming from OPEC uh, there as, a, as an associated uh, byproduct of, of gas being developed for power generation. So we see a significant amount of NGLs coming from Iran. Uh, we do see gas production growth in Iran, uh, and I think Anne Sophie was uh, might have talked about this uh, last week or when she was here. Uh, but you know, Iran has been uh, successful in, in, in uh, increasing investment and development in the gas sector, unlike the oil sector, under the sanctions regime. So we see that continuing, creating more, more NGS, uh, more NGS from other countries in the Middle East and, and of course, from, uh, from the US in a, in a big way. So in terms of, of uh, trade, as I, as I mentioned, um, we see trade really shifting eastward. Uh, North America, in our view, becomes a net oil exporter uh, 
by the end of the decade. So this is about 10 years sooner, I think, that we had the forecast last year. <laughs> but uh, we, we see that, we see, so we're not really clear, you know, is it gonna be exporting products or is it being exporting crude? We've been dancing around this issue a little bit because of the uh, uncertainty surrounding U.S. crude exports, but we, we think on balance it's going to be a, a net oil exporter. Um, we see some exports of crude coming from Canada, uh, uh, even without any changes in the U.S. legislation. So in this forecast, we see about half a million barrels of, of crude exports out of Canada by the end of the decade, uh, roughly 200 to Europe and 300 to Asia. Um, but we, we see, of course, uh, product exports uh, on a large scale coming from, from North America. Uh, China really, uh, is, this year, uh, takes over uh, from the U.S. as the largest crude importer in the world, and Asia as a whole uh, really becomes the, the magnet for, for, for global crude trade in a very large way. So by, by uh, 2019, we think 65% of crude internationally traded ends up in Asia, uh, which is a big increase from today. Even today, it's very large, but it continues to increase. Uh, exports from the Middle East, decrease, in our view, crude exports decrease because more crude in uh, the Middle East, in, in the UAE, in Saudi, is, re is refined domestically. Uh, but the, the Middle East remains the largest crude exporter in, in the world as a region. Uh, in the US, obviously, uh, more crude that's being refined in the US is sourced domestically or in Canada, so there's less need for imports, it's packing out imports. So less, less movement into, into the U.S., so that's kind of uh, obvious, I guess. Uh, we do see an increase in product trade, though. In terms of, of refining capacity, we've downgraded our forecast of refining capacity. So last year, we, we had a forecast of about 9 million uh, barrels per day of new capacity. Now it's down to 7 plus, which is just about the same as the increase in demand. Uh, but even though our forecast of, of capacity increases matches the forecast of demand growth, uh, we see an increase in overcapacity because more uh, products are now being pr produced from NGLs or from biofuels, bypassing the refining sector. So we see uh, overcapacity increasing by about 2 million barrels per day, assuming, no, uh, assuming that uh, existing capacity remains flat. And we, we feel that in order to, for refining margins to go back, for, in order for utilization rates of refining capacity to go back to the level of around 2008, which is the last time global refining margins were pretty healthy across the board, we would need to reduce capacity by almost 5 million barrels per day. And this could be mothballing or shutdown of obsolete or old refining capacity, or this could be cancellation of projects or delays in projects, further delays in projects. We have reduced the Chinese forecast by, by a significant amount. We have reduced uh, by, I think, almost 2 million barrels per day. From, this is where most of the reduction is coming from. And this is kind of a new development, because until recently in China, the tendency was once a project was approved, it was going forward, there was no going back on it. And in the last year, we've seen a significant amount of going back on projects both by Chinese companies, CNPC, uh, Sinopec, and by the, their joint venture partners, uh, moving out of China, or delaying investment, canceling investment in the downstream sector. So that's, uh, that's a significant adjustment. We still see China as becoming net, uh, a net exporter, being long products, but more by accident than by design. They're trying not to be uh, an exporter. This is not their, their strategy. This is more like a, uh, something that may be temporary. Uh, demand eventually will catch up, but they may be a net exporter for, for some period of time. Uh, India is an exporter by design. It's, a, it's an industrial activity. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a business model. Uh, the U.S. is a, is a, is a very large exporter. Uh, we see uh, growth in, uh, in other Asia. That's India, but that's also some of the other smaller countries. The other region where we cut back the, we shaved the, the forecast of, of uh, refining capacity growth is Latin America, and that's mostly Brazil because Petrobras is overstretched. Uh, spending too much money on the, on the subsalt uh, development uh, projects and also overstretched in, in, uh, by importing high price international gasoline and selling it domestically at subsidized or controlled prices. So uh, we see very significant delays. You know, there's some projects moving on, moving forward, but maybe many significant delays in, in, uh, in, in Brazil, which kind of changes the picture because we see now Latin America as remaining a net importer of products, which was uh, last year was more in balance. Uh, so, so big changes uh, there, and now looking at product supply, we try to model product supply based on our expectation of refining capacity, uh, 
uh, crude supply, including crude quality and, and refining capacity by type of uh, capacity, de uh, conversion depth, and then demand by product. And what we see is, uh, is very significant growth in distillate production capacity coming from the US, from the Middle East, and from, the, and from Russia, as well as from Asia. Uh, but we see very dramatic uh, uh, increases in European imports. Uh, Europe becomes even more dependent on, on the DC8 imports than it is today. This raises all kinds of, of uh, security issues for, for Europe, which uh, are very much on the front burner today, and uh, we're trying to, to uh, uh, think around and try to articulate, but we haven't fully uh, spin, spinned out all the, the security implications, but there's very significant implications. Uh, today, it looks like the, the district market is pretty sloppy. There's already kind of overcapacity. Uh, over the forecast period, there may be times when the market is more or less tight or more or less uh, sloppy. Right now, there's, there's a lot of DCD capacity. There's a big uncertainty factor there uh, in terms of how tight the market will really be, which has to be with how quickly the shipping industry will adjust to new um, sulfur requirements the effective date of which is still unclear. So the IMO has a plan to tighten sulfur standards dramatically worldwide, but nobody is sure whether it's going to be 2020 or 2025. And most of the people we spoke to said 2025, but they were talking their book. Uh, I, I don't think anybody uh, is sure, and I think there's a very strong case for saying it's 2020. So uh, there's different ways in which the shipping industry can adjust to, to, this, uh, to these new standards. And those include uh, installing scrubbers on ships, retrofitting ships and putting scrubbers on, on, the, on the, the deck and, uh, to, to, to scrub out the emissions, sulfur emissions, or uh, moving to uh, low sulfur distillates or some kind of distillate uh, from, from a ZID, or moving to uh, LNG. And we think it's probably going to be a combination of the three. We're a little bit unclear about the timing. The timing is very hard to pin down right now. But in the event of a fast and large-scale move from residual fuel oil to distillates, uh, we could have a significantly tighter market than, than otherwise for, for distillates. So there's, there's some uncertainty there. Uh, in, in gasoline, on the other hand, it's, it's a glut pretty much everywhere. The only country that's a, a large importer of gasoline, in our view, uh, by the end of the decade is Asia, the only region, uh, you know, African on a small scale. But uh, there's a massive buildup, in our view, of light distillates, gasoline and naphtha, uh, in, in, uh, in North America, continued length in, in Europe, despite the reductions in refining capacity that we've been through and that we might go through in the next five years, and, and a buildup in gasoline supply in, in Russia and, uh, and the Middle East as well. So finding a home for all this light supply uh, is going to be a challenge and could really be a constraint on refining activity and on the production of other products as well. And this is kind of a, a snapshot that tries to capture the balance in terms of uh, the implications for OPEX per capacity. And uh, so the, the, the columns represent the nominal capacity, and that's, we see that as increasing to about 6 million barrels per day for the last three years of the forecast. That's a little bit less than what we had forecast last year, but it's still very steep. But if we make an adjustment to that of 1.5, then we have uh, a top capacity that's pretty much the same as we had in 2009 after the, uh, the financial crisis. But again, this capacity is very much at risk. Uh, it's very unclear that all the growth we see from Iraq will, will happen. And there's also scope for problems in other countries, uh, Venezuela, Algeria, Nigeria, uh, significant political uh, secu instability, security issues that could, that could uh, uh, cause problems and could, could cause uh, capacity to be not quite as uh, comfortable as this, uh, this uh, slide implies. Great. Well. Antoine, thanks very much. You've certainly given us a bunch to think about. Um, while everyone thinks of your questions, uh, I wanted to ask one particular question about um, uh, about the global refining sector. I recall last year when we were sort of talking this through, there was a perception that not only was there the possibility of sort of overcapacity in global refining markets, but a lot of the new capacity builds were being by by being built by companies. Well, that one perhaps weren't necessarily as responsive to market signals, but two were doing what you you sort of alluded to, or you you, you talked directly to, uh, in your remarks, which was they're they're more complex. They're integrated with the you know sort of large uh, large scale petrochemical facilities. It's much harder to sort of gauge. 
their competitiveness and their response to the need to drive out, you know, maybe five million barrels a day of refining capacity. So in, in, in light of that sort of that discussion, um, where do you think uh, refineries will be particularly under pressure uh, in that new sort of competitive environment and what might the response be? And then the second, sort of if I can, to build off on that is, uh, is clearly there's a discussion here about sort of competitiveness of U.S. refiners depending on what we do with our crude export laws. So how do, how do you think of those things together uh, when you look at the outlook? Well, in terms of which refineries are going to be under, under pressure, I think it's it seems fairly clear that uh, refineries in, in Europe and, uh, and also in Japan will be under pressure. So Japan has just completed in March a, a first round of refinery consolidation uh, with several closures. And immediately, as soon as the, the, the run was over, they immediately announced a new round of consolidation. And they're planning another 400 or close to half a million barrels of new, new closures in the next few months. So there's clearly, uh, in J Japan is pretty unique because it's really policy driven. There's a government policy support for refining closures. Um, the motivations behind the, the, the policy are maybe complex, maybe not exactly, uh, 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 there's different views of what the, the motivations really are. I mean, one of the, one of the drivers clearly is the increased competition from, from China uh, against a, a context of slowing demand growth or, or diminishing demand in o OECD Asia. Uh, so Japan has been an importer of products, but also an exporter to places like Korea, and now finds itself competing against very competitive Chinese refineries. So it's, 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 it's closing down capacity. Europe is, is clearly very much at risk. Uh, Europe is, uh, is suffering from you know, a kind of perfect storm of uh, uh, contracting demand, uh, high energy costs compared to North American refineries, which benefit from cheap natural gas. Uh, crude supply problems with Libya uh, out of the market uh, on and off, uh, North Sea in decline, uh, Russia moving its crude exports more east and exporting more products to compete with European refineries. So it's, it's facing competition, it's facing problems, and, uh, and refiners have not really, on the, uh, globally speaking, I mean, to speak, uh, broadly speaking, have not really invested very much in, in European capacity for many years. Refiners were comfortable, depending on the uh, U.S. demand for gasoline to, to dispose of their excess gasoline production, and kind of deferred investment, and now it's coming back to bite them, and the refineries are obsolete, very old, uh, not very performant, and, and, and so on. So there's, there's clearly pressure there. That doesn't mean that all refiners will, uh, will be in the same boat, and there's going to be winners and losers. And recently, Exxon just announced a, a, a very large investment program in the, in the Antwerp refinery. Uh, which in a way could seem counterintuitive, but, uh, but clearly some, some refineries will come out on top in, in Europe and, uh, and others will be under pressure. Uh, so there's new, just, just in the last week or two, uh, e &I, uh, announced some closures. So we're going to see more of the same, we think. Um, and there's concerns, political concerns in European countries about what this means and you know, the job losses and the, the problems in terms of energy supply security. But uh, it's, it's, there's not so much that the governments can do. It's really uh, corporate driven. Um, now, um, in terms of uh, U.S. competitiveness, I think the U.S. competitiveness is, is uh, U.S. refineries are clearly at a very strong advantage, and in my view, that's going to continue even if there's some relaxation of exports. Uh, the benefit from you know, economies of scale, state of the art, access to market, easy, easy logistical connections, um, uh, cheap natural gas, cheap energy costs. So they, 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 a long list of competitive advantages. The question is, going forward, I mean, in the last few years, as the U.S. moved from being a net importer to being the largest net exporter of, uh, of products in, in the world, the U.S. has found easy markets uh, to export the products because the European, European refineries were uh, a weak, uh, a weak uh, competitor. And then there was growing demand in Latin America. Mexico has not been investing in, Mexi in, in refining capacity. It's been importing more and more. Uh, other uh, Latin American refineries or countries, even if they have had domestic goals of expanding domestic capacity, have found it that it was cheaper to just bring in products from competitive U.S. refineries. But looking forward, it's not so clear that there will be so much more room to accommodate a further increase in, in U.S. product uh, exports. Uh, because U.S. exporters will, will compete now uh, much more uh, fiercely with this new capacity coming from the Middle East, coming from Asia, and also coming from Russia. 
Russia is not so much expanding capacity as upgrading capacity. They're changing the, the tax regime so that it, to incentivize the, the export of, of light products as opposed to resid. And, and we've seen over the last uh, few years a very significant growth in, in uh, Russian product exports to, to Europe. Last year, they, they grew by 14%. There's more growth coming this year. There's probably a lot more growth coming in the next few years. So uh, Europe, for instance, has been one of the top two destinations for U.S. distillate exports. Uh, where the U.S. will have to compete uh, very, very uh, aggressively against Russian exports to Europe in the next few years. So it's not clear that the, the refining model, that the ability to, to depend on refining to, to uh, move out the, the, the growth in the domestic supply in the U.S. will continue to be the, the way to go in the next few years. And then quickly, just because we're in, in North America, it, switching to the upstream, you, you mentioned that you have a, a, an outlook that sort of matches with what your Rio colleagues are doing in terms of U.S. light tide oil production that begins to sort of plateau and or decline sort of, you know, towards the end of the decade. Um, but you've now been doing this for several years, right? And uh, uh, so could you talk a little bit about what the basis for your view on U.S. production trends in light tide oil is, just because it's a it's kind of a moving ball and we're all, all tracking it. Do you take the AE? outlook or do you in, in which one and how, how do you look at that sort of how has it changed over the last few years well so so we do I mean we look at the AEO outlook we look at uh, YSTAT we look at some uh, at Bentec we look at uh, some of the uh, uh, companies and uh, consultancies and so on what, what the data is available in the market we're not trying to replicate what the US is doing uh, I think the EIA is really uh, putting up a tremendous uh, effort uh, to, to upgrade their statistical collection to, to reflect the new supply reality. We can't, there's no point in us replicating that. So we kind of uh, uh, depend on that to a large degree. We look at production trends. We, we've been revising. I mean, we've got, like many others, we've been revising upwards our forecast for the last few years. The scope of the revisions has kind of slowed a little bit. It's less, uh, slightly less embarrassing and, and dramatic than uh, <laughs> it was. It was in previous years, but it continues to, yeah. we continue to revise. Um, what we do see is a little bit of a shift in investments. I mean, the, the, the land grab period of uh, light that development has kind of come to an end. We see companies you know, not, not buying land anymore, uh, acreage, but trying to improve the cash flows. And uh, so we, we assume that there's going to be some implications for supply growth in terms of the, the pace of growth from that. It's actually a good sort of add on to that question. You have a lot of your production outlook that is uh, sort of predicated on sort of geopolitics, political stability, and, and existing policy. But there's also, with uh, most of the companies that we, we watch, uh, there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of discussion about sort of capital discipline. Uh, did that work its way into sort of your, your upstream outlook uh, for this time around? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, clearly. Clearly, uh, that's, been, that's been one of the factors. Uh, curbing a little bit the growth in, in places outside of the U.S. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, questions. We've got some ground rules. Please identify yourself and your affiliation, and if you can make your question in the form of a question, uh, that'd be great. Uh, also, wait for, uh, do we have microphones for today? Yeah, wait for a microphone because we also have, uh, we're webcasting as well. So, anyone want to start? Wow, they're shy. Uh, so, uh, well, why you think of some questions, uh, one of the things that I also wanted to ask about was you, you, you didn't talk in depth about Libya. Uh, and so you did talk about Iraq. Uh, maybe if we could do a, a quick sort of overview of a couple of those, uh, of those countries. Uh, first, I think you had quite, quite honestly mentioned that, you know, you, Iraq sort of happened in an inopportune time uh, point for your, your publication cycle, which everybody sort of understands. I do think uh, the STEO may have gone ahead and reduced their outlook by about, what, 300,000 barrels a day. Uh, uh, so if you had to do it over uh, today, uh, what do you think you might interpret for Iraq? And, and Libya probably also falls into that same category, right? Um, uh, it sort of fooled us all by coming back quicker than expected, but then coming off again. And so how do you think about uh, the outlook for Libya as well? Right. So for Libya, we have, we have a kind of a flat production growth from uh, capacity growth for the period. We do see Libya coming back. We're not expecting the country to remain uh, completely uh, out of commission. Uh, but looking at the short term, we're kind of uh, perhaps a little bit more skeptical than the market seems to be. Right? Uh, a lot of People seem very confident that supply will come now that the uh, um, rebel uh, groups uh, have agreed to leave the blockade on the, the terminals. Um, well, we're not so sure. I mean, there's still uh, many, many um, uncertainties going forward. We have to wait 
for the result of the council elections, which I think is coming out uh, July 20th or, or around there. It's not clear that the, the, the outcome of the elections would be uh, to the liking of the, uh, the, the parties uh, there. Uh, it's not clear that the elections would be viable. I mean, uh, many uh, uh, constituencies could not even vote. Uh, some candidates may be disqualified after the fact because the, 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 the vetting of the candidates really took, is taking place after the election, not before. Uh, so uh, we might end up with a council with only 200 elected members out of 250, and that might really jeopardize the, uh, I mean, it's difficult to speculate about the, the, the outcome, but I just want to uh, emphasize the, the uncertainties that remain. And then the, the troops, the, the, the fighters, if you like, we, the militias which had located the, the, uh, the, the terminals have not left the terminals. They agreed not to blockade and now under federal payroll. Uh, but they're still there. So in the event of a uh, rekindling of uh, uh, disagreements, physically it, it wouldn't be very difficult to blockade the ports again. So we're, we're not really sure. And then it will take some time for uh, exports to resume and for production to resume. There's going to be a need to do maintenance on the, on the terminals to make sure that the uh, product that's in, in storage has not been contaminated, crude. Uh, this is going to take some time, then uh, we're not really sure the extent of the field damage, what, whatever long-lasting damage might have been inflict inflicted on the fields from uh, more or less controlled shutdowns or extended shutdowns. So there's, there's still many question marks. We don't really uh, anticipate a quick ramp up in, in uh, Libyan supply. We think it's going to be, at, at, in the best of cases, uh, gradual and, and pretty slow. Um, but we, we assume that it's going to come back yeah. eventually. And what about Iraq? I mean, you, 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 uh, the question of where the sort of you know 300,000 barrel a day number would come from, obviously that may have something to do with the pipeline repair uh, work that will likely not get done in the north. Um, but, but also sort of medium term speculation about what kind of investment might not come on line in terms of too, or too early to tell from your perspective? I, I think or? it's a bit too early to tell because it's very difficult to, to, to say uh, which way things would move. I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation that the KRG will now uh, consolidate its control of Kirkuk and will be able to ramp up production of Kirkuk and export it uh, via the pipeline. Uh, it's not really sh clear to us that the KRG can even hold on to Kirkuk. It's not, uh, it's not guaranteed. Um, and then uh, there's uh, uncertainties about the future of the government in Baghdad. So there's, there's too many question marks, I think, to, to uh, I think I would agree that uh, there's going to be a freeze in investment or the company is going to be on the fence and uh, not sinking, uh, not, not pouring a lot of money into, into Iraq right now. Uh, they've been removing personnel even from the south. Uh, even Chinese companies have been moving personnel. And uh, when Chinese companies moved personnel out of Libya, it didn't play out very well in Beijing. They came out uh, under a lot of flack and uh, took a lot of flack for that in Beijing. So the fact that they're taking people out in, uh, in Iraq, even in southern Iraq today, I think says a lot about the perception of, of uh, uncertainty and risk. Uh, and certainly, we, 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 in the best of cases, move things, uh, delay things. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's too early to say you know, whether the greater KRG independence will, will unlock more supply from the north or. not go south, but if the Iraqi army truly disintegrates, the only option in the south will be the Iranian uh, ground troops, and that, that suggests a much broader uh, regional conflict. Uh, so the question is how you reconcile um, the Saudi concerns um, and the Qatari support of ISIS, so that's, that's a big question. Uh, I want to ask you about Sahel in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. There's a spread of um, radical Islamist forces from Nigeria to Mali to Niger, but at the same time, there's a potential there. There's some geologists, some discoveries that suggest that there are more uh, oil than we expect. Uh, do you have any assessment about Sahel, and uh, is that going to be a viable uh, territory and as, as large as it is? Thank you. Well, you know, for, for Iraq, I mean, it's, there's a number of, of worst case scenarios that one can come up with for Iraq, and you outline one of them. You could, you, there could be other, you know, uh, worst case uh, developments. Uh, 
it's difficult to speculate about those. So we, we kind of constrain, especially as, a, as the IES, international organization, we're less perhaps uh, free to speculate about potential outcomes than a think tank or a consultancy or even a bank. So we're, 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 we haven't gone there. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of waiting and watching. Uh, our forecast is basically based on what we know about investments, what we know about regulations, what we know about uh, uh, demand trends and, and uh, access to capital, uh, economic growth. It's not, it's not based on uh, potential uh, political outcomes, and, and we don't do scenarios. Uh, we leave scenarios to the World Energy Outlook. What we try to do is our best, case, uh, best guess, given all, all the things we know, for the next five years, which correspond more or less to the next business cycle. So we should basically know everything we need to know to come up with a guess. That's, that's, our, that's the nature of our exercise, if you like. Um, okay, we've got yeah. right just, maybe just the, the, the question okay. about uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, sir. We, uh, we don't have too much growth coming from there. Uh, we think a lot of the investment is being uh, moved to secure market, to, to mature markets. And actually, one of the perhaps unexpected or uh, counterintuitive consequences of light title revolution in the U.S. is that it's it's pouring more investment into very mature players like the North Sea or or uh, uh, mature fields in Russia, uh, as some of the technologies are applied to those to those conventional fields, and there's uh, and also there's more investment just in, in North America, but this it's taken away some investment in our view from uh, from frontier markets which are uh, don't have the same uh, uh, tradition of uh, oil development and uh, where there's also a risk of, of very significant cost increases. Yes, good morning. Um, John Kinese with uh, Hard Energy Research and Consulting. Appreciate your comments here. Um, two questions really, but the main one is, uh, do you see further partnering, if you will, between China and Russia? They've got a major gas deal. Do you see that on crude? The second question is, in the U.S., the surplus of products, naphtha, condensates, et cetera, uh, what are the markets going to be for those exports? Is it all going to go to Asia? Yeah, I, I think we, we have to look for more cooperations between Russia and, uh, and China, and uh, it uh, serves both uh, sides' interests. I mean, the Chinese need energy. They need to diversify their supply sources, and the Russians... Uh, are increasingly interested in, in moving uh, the exports eastwards as opposed to westward. And th there's capacity to do so in oil. Uh, in gas, uh, there's constraints on how much uh, Russian export can be ramped up to, to China uh, just because of, uh, you know, gas that's produced in the west cannot be easily moved eastward. But for oil, it's, it's a little bit easier. There's a lot of overcapacity in the uh, transport network in, in China. There's, uh, in Russia, there's more options, more optionality, Just by virtue of oil being easier to transport. So we, we're, we're looking for more uh, integration or more partnership, if you'd like. Uh, and the other question was? The market for naphtha and condensate, what it all Yeah, means. condensate. I mean, uh, condensate, um, you know, there's not, the domestic market for condensate in the U.S. is limited, uh, which is why we've, been, we've seen such a ramp up in, in condensate inventories in, uh, in the Gulf Coast. Uh, but condensate demand in Asia is, is booming, so it's kind of a match uh, made in heaven there uh, between uh, North American supply and Asian demand. Uh, but there's other potential users for condensate. Uh, for instance, in Venezuela, uh, NAFTA can be used to uh, mix with uh, bitumen and make bitumen exportable, and that's a model that could be a, a cheap substitute for building very expensive aggregated plants in, in Venezuela that like has been done in the late 90s. Uh, instead of building you know, very capital intensive and uh, cumbersome plant uh, upgraders, you could just mix NAFTA and that's, that's what I think Venezuela has been doing. Whenever the upgraders go down for maintenance, they, they bring up more NAFTA from the US. Um, and, and again, condensate in, in, uh, in Canada as well for the same reasons as diluent uh, that's supporting uh, heavy, heavy oil uh, production. Michelle Melton, CSIS Energy Program. I have two distinct questions. The first is about frontier energy, specifically if you could talk a little bit about the Arctic and potential for development there. I know it's not in the medium term, and I apologize for making you speak to the long term. And the second question is about Iran. 
um, assuming that there is some sort of deal in the next six months, what the prospects are for actually f the physical prospects for ramping up oil, how fast that can come online, how much we're talking about, and over what time period. Thank you. Well, the, <clears throat> the Arctic, as, as you said, is kind of a longer term prospect, so we haven't really built in any expectation from Arctic production in, in a significant way in the, in the medium term. Uh, that's something that the WIO team is looking at and uh, which will be addressed in the World Energy Outlook that will come, in, come out in November. Um, and uh, Iran, th there's a great deal of uncertainty because I don't think anybody is really sure how the, the fields have responded to the prolonged you know, uh, shutdown of, of capacity as a result of the sanctions. So there's different views out there, and it may depend field by field. Uh, some think that uh, the shutdowns have really caused permanent damage in capacity, permanent reductions in, in long-term capacity. There's a contrarian or opposite view that, in fact, uh, it's allowed fields to rest and uh, they're going to come out in, in better shape uh, from the sanctions than they were before. And again, it might, it might be uh, both answers, mo both, both views might be right depending on which fields we're talking about. But we, we, don't, we really don't know for sure. What we think is it's going to take some time for Iranian production to, to come back, even if there's an easing of sanctions, because uh, it's going to take time to just build up the capacity to get the revolutionary guards out of the picture completely, to uh, bring investment back in. Uh, so we, we think it's going to be a, a fairly slow and gradual process which is why, it's partly why we haven't really built any, any expectation of, of supply. I mean, we made the, the assumption that the sanctions remain in place because it seemed the, 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 uh, the safer course, or for lack of a better alternative. But even if we uh, assume some, it's gonna take time to remove the sanctions. And not all the sanctions have been put in place at the same time. Some will be easier to remove than others. And then it's gonna take time for, to bring investment, to bring capacity, to build capacity, to, to bring production back online. Thank you, Anton. As always, an excellent presentation, especially without notes. <laughs> uh, it looked to me like the refinery sector margins is, could be even uh, more pessimistic than, than you were alluding to because of so much of the new liquids outside of the refining system. You go from 91 million demand globally to 100, about 100 in the five years. How much of that nine is actually crude that has to run through the crude distillation units? You probably had it on one of those charts, but I didn't, I didn't know exactly what that number might be. Well, we, think, we think the increase is about seven, north of seven. And of that, two million is gonna be met by products that don't go through a refinery. So including biofuel and, uh, and NGS and, and maybe a little bit more refinery gains as refineries become more you know, performing. So yes, it's, it's, it's significant pressure. Hi, I'm Tracy Liao from Brookings Institution. Um, you talk a little bit about the conventional oil development in North America and also Latin America. Can you expand that a little bit to talk about like what do you think of the um, uh, unconventional oil like prospects in Asia and other places of the world? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, as I said, uh, I mean, what do you mean by unconventional? Like title or, 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 or uh, pre-sold is conventional by your definition or unconventional? Well, like light oil probably. Like. Yeah, light title, uh, as, as I mentioned, we think there's, we think it's going to start picking up, the production will pick up outside the U.S. I don't think we see too much light title coming from Asia. You know, we see some, some from Australia beginning in the, at the end of the decade, but more in the, in the next decade. Uh, we, we're not really expecting too much from China uh, because uh, we see the resource as too, too uh, challenging there and, um, and also other, other types of problems. Uh, so I think and Sophie was seeing some, some uh, shade gas coming from China, but on, on the oil side, we don't, we're not really seeing much there. Uh, 
So I think for the next five years, really, it's really at the tail end of the forecast and outside of North America, including Canada, and it's really, um, it's really uh, mostly Argentina and Russia in our view because this, the resource is so huge, companies are committed, are invested, want, want to develop it, and there's political will in the countries to make it happen, and the, the investment climate has been changed to accommodate that. So that's, that's where we see a change. Mexico, of course, has a, has a huge potential, uh, but we, we're not really seeing huge growth until the next decade uh, because we, we think you know, the secondary legislation has still to be uh, approved and, and passed, and then uh, it's going to take some time. Then we see you know, easy, uh, the, 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 the um, low-hanging fruits being picked in the next couple of years, but then uh, it's going to take a few years for investment to, to come to fruition, and we see actually maybe a bump in, in supply in the next couple of years, a little bit of a drop, and then a pick up again towards the end of the period. But the, the real growth, in our view, will be in the, in the, in the next decade. And there's shared potential uh, or, or light light potential on the other side of the Eagle Ford. But uh, it's, it's kind of a rough neighborhood there. So we're not really, uh, we don't really expect investment to pour in very quickly there, uh, right off. If I could just build on that for one second, I had noticed in your, uh, in your uh, non-OPEC supply chart, you did have two fairly sizable bumps in Latin America, South America in 2015 and 2017. Is that basically Brazil pre-salt 2015 and, and 17 is, yeah, as well? Right. Okay, all right. Okay. Great presentation. Um, just going back to the question on the Arctic, I was reading something about how oil interests are almost rooting for the progression and worsening of climate change so that they could exploit the mar market um, in the Arctic so that you know they can't put the refineries on moving pieces of ice and if they melt then it's easier to get the oil out of there. Um, is that connection at all accurate? And you know, yeah, that, that's my question. You also just your name and, and Sure, my name's Jake and I'm an intern for the American Council on Renewable Energy. Great. Well, there's clearly a lot of interest, and uh, especially in Russian Arctic, we, we've seen companies like Exxon uh, spending money there. So, uh, so no doubt, this is a, a very uh, attractive prospect, and uh, but we, we're not seeing it just now. We think it's going to take some time, more, more than five years. Mm. Uh, other questions? One of the other things I wanted to look and uh, ask you about is you, you talked about how China, uh, obviously uh, China's demand growth uh, forecast being such a, a big part of, of your outlook. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion, including recently at the China Strategic and Economic Dialogue, about one, improving the data that we have and share on, on sort of Chinese uh, consumption figures, but then also on, on what has been sort of uh, theorized to be a big part of their demand pull for this year, which is filling the SPR, right? So how does how does uh, that uh, sort of lack of information, I guess, if you will, about what the rate of SPR fill, the long term, out, the long term, the medium term outlook for that, how does that sort of affect how you gauge uh, Chinese uh, genuine sort of oil demand from a consumption perspective versus what they're doing from a more strategic perspective? So we, we kind of distinguish the two. We, the way we calculate, the way we assess uh, Chinese demand is, is we don't look at crude imports per se. We look at uh, refinery runs and product imports. So uh, we, we do, of course, monitor Chinese crude imports and we do follow crude trade in general. But we don't consider, uh, we, don't, we don't factor the SPR uh, building in, in China within the demand figures. It, it's separate. So yes, we, we, we try to come up with an assessment. I mean, we, we look at uh, crude imports, we look at refinery runs, we look at the reported uh, commercial stock changes in China, which is difficult to interpret uh, with confidence because those, those changes are expressed in percentage terms, but we don't really know what the baseline is. <laughs> and uh, presumably the baseline has changed a lot over the last few years, but there's, there's no information about this. So given these uncertainties, we try to assess you know, the difference so in the, in the second quarter, we've seen a huge, huge increase in stock builds, not accounted, but what looks like the reported commercial stock builds. And this is, I think, about seven, five, 75 million barrels, which is a huge <coughs> amount uh, 
we're not expecting that, that level of stock building to continue you know, at a steady pace over the, the next, uh, over the foreseeable future. This probably was a bit of a one-off because a bunch of, of capacity, storage capacity was just completed that, that can accommodate this, this rise. And then the, the Chinese uh, buying patterns for SPR buildings seem to be fairly market opportunistic and they might have seen an opportunity during the second quarter when demand typically drops a bit uh, to, to do this. Um, and demand is, uh, Demand is obviously uh, also uh, an uncertainty, and uh, we've been kind of flip-flopping a little bit based on the, the latest numbers, yeah. but I think the trend is towards a slowdown in the economy and a, a slowdown in, in, in demand growth and, and a very significant increase in, in uh, or decrease in oil intensity and increase in efficiency. And just staying on the data point for a minute, um, as well as you had sort of mentioned in your uh, in your presentation that um, you don't feel like you have adequate numbers on African uh, energy demand growth uh, growth rate. And in you know in the early 2000s, not having adequate numbers in terms of Chinese oil demand right. was actually ended up being a big surprise both for the market and for analysts. Do you look at sort of the situation in Africa as being similar? Or is that something that was a particular feature of the Chinese market given its size and the rate of growth? Now we look at it. I mean, one, one key. Uh, I mean, China. I think the big surprise in China back in the 2000s was uh, the um, when when uh, the power plants were um, being overextended, and there was blackouts and, and brownouts, and there was this huge surge in in demand uh, for diesel for backup generators in late 2003, 2004, which when demand increased by uh, about one million barrels per day. So we've seen some of that. I mean, the, this increase in, in backup generators is, is, is something that's worldwide. It's not just China. And actually, Chinese producers of backup generators are now exporting. I was in Pakistan last year, and there's an entire souk uh, of uh, backup generators, and Chinese companies are very active there because their market at home has shrunk uh, as, as power generation has caught up. Uh, so there's massive, difficult to assess demand for that. Uh, we try to, to follow it as closely as we can. And in a place like Nigeria, for instance, there was a huge surge in backup generators a few years ago. But in the last two or three years, we've seen a decline. We've seen a drop. And uh, there seem to be, the, the Nigerians seem to have uh, achieved some success in increasing you know, power generation from, uh, from power plants, including from natural gas. And that's really seemed to have taken a little bit of an edge off the, the diesel demand. So, but it's, it's very difficult to track country by country, and uh, there's very poor data on this. But we're, we're, we're trying to we're trying to monitor, you know, exports of backup generators and that sort of thing. Um, well, one I mean, perhaps maybe one final question um, would be uh, you uh, you mentioned on sort of the, the the spare capacity figures that you were coming up with, and, and you'd also sort of talked about your outlook for production. Uh, in, in Kuwait, and typically in a lot of different outlooks, there, the, the combined sort of effective spare capacity ends up being in, not effective, excuse me, spare capacity ends up being in, in a combination of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Um, if, you don't, uh, if you don't see more production or more project uh, growth in, in Kuwait in particular, do you think over, over the forecast period that has any sort of impact in anticipated spare capacity in Kuwait? Well, <coughs> we, we hope Based on our conversation, recent conversations with Kuwait since the, uh, the report came out, we hope that we'll be able to upgrade our forecast of Kuwaiti capacity yeah. next year. Now, now we have contraction. We're, we're, not, we're not expecting to see it, more it's contraction. Right. Yeah, right. We're hoping that we'll be able to revise upwards and, and show more, more growth in capacity yeah. or less decline. Okay. And one final, sorry, I know I said that before. Uh, <laughs> one, one additional question. You know, we always love your trade flow uh, charts, and I know that you, you talked a little bit about it at the, the Energy Information Administration conference earlier this, uh, this week. Um, do you get any sort of different sort of strategic outlook or insights from looking at the world, not necessarily in terms of net balances, but in terms of overall trade flows? Uh, and the reason I ask that is, what, as we're sort of looking at the sort of new U.S. energy posture, this view of us being a net exporter and a huge product exporter is really, it is a, it's a helpful view, right? And it's, it's certainly one part of the story, but it isn't sort of the total, it isn't the total story, right? And so when you look at sort of gross trade flows, even within North America, uh, it's a much more complicated picture. You could actually find the United States being an importer and an exporter on a much more significant basis, given sort of those broader shifts towards Asia, more trade and product uh, 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 versus crude, 
do you see a much more complex sort of trade regime emerging as a result of that? And, and was there anything that came out in that recent IEA strategic stocks review discussion that sort of alludes to positioning for a world where there's more product trade than crude? I don't know if I'm being well, clear, but it's kind of complicated. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. No, it, it certainly is complicated. I mean, it's, it's much more difficult to um, forecast or to model product trade flows than, than crude trade flows. Uh, and you have to use a lot of assumptions and make a lot of uh, guesses. So there's a lot more uncertainty there, that, that, no doubt about it. Many more moving parts and, uh, and questions. There are some things that I think are making product trade simpler in a way, and, and that's a little bit of a convergence in specs. You know, the, the market used to be extremely fragmented with uh, non OECD countries having, you know, leather gasoline and high sulfur and OECD countries being at various levels of clean products. We're seeing a lot more convergence now. The Chinese specs are looking a lot more like US specs and a lot more like European specs. So there's a bit of a homogenization of, 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 uh, of specs to some degree, at least for the basic products, you know, maybe not the final retail product, but the, the basic products. And then there's a bit of a change in the global infrastructure with the emergence of, of uh, major terminal hubs, you know, uh, where you can preposition products and, and redistribute them depending on market trends. So in a place like uh, the Caribbean, you know, right here outside the U.S., uh, where there's always been very large storage capacity for crude and for resid, uh, we've seen lately in the last five years uh, a shift, some of that capacity being converted to diesel or to gasoline and, and also expanded. So there's a massive now capacity to store gasoline, preposition gasoline, diesel in the Caribbean. The same is happening in you know, the Waldenheim area, in the Fujera area, in, in, uh, in Asia. This is an ongoing trend. Uh, it, it, it's also challenging because we have often limited information about stock level in those countries. So when we look at US stocks of products, we look at the US 50, we don't look at what's going on in Aruba or uh, the Bahamas. But in fact, Aruba and the Bahamas are very, very much part of the supply picture for the US and we're missing a tremendous piece of the of, of, the, of, the, of the picture if we don't take that into account. Yeah. Uh, but right. Well, well, Antoine, thank you very much for coming. You always give us a great deal to think about uh, and uh, uh, certainly we'll be uh, looking for your update next year and hope that you'll come back to talk with us again. Thank you. Thanks very much.